Right, let's get a start, um, shall we? So I'd like to give a warm welcome to all of you in attendance. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Luke Scanlon and I'm the ANZ Channel Marketing Manager. This is a solutions-based webinar. Uh, our aim for today is to provide an overview of the heat service management module. So the um, items we'll be covering is incident problem change, knowledge, CMDB, self-service, service catalogue, and we'll also um, have a bit on voice as well. Um, so we're very excited to share this with you and to show it off. Um, statistics, uh, everyone has been muted um, throughout the presentation. If you do have a question, you can use the Q&A pane and direct your questions to the panellists. The chat pane is also available for you as well. Um, it's being recorded. Um, on the call with us today, Gary Wang. He's our AP Director of Solutions. He'll be leading the demonstration, and I'll um, now pass you over to him. Take it away. Thanks, Luke. Um, so I will take approximately um, about 50 minutes for the presentation, so I'll go through a few slides, and following that, we'll actually do a product presentation itself. So you have to get a feel of the software, uh, but at the end, uh, we'll try to wrap up uh, a few minutes earlier so we can actually have some time for Q&A as well. Uh, so to kick it off, um, I've got the um, service management slide uh, that should be on your screen. I'm aware that uh, this is done through a web meet, so there could be a bit of lag. And um, yeah, so I'll, I'll be conscious of that as I'm moving along the slides. Okay, but um, I'm just switching over to the first slide now, and hopefully that shows up in a few seconds. Uh, but basically, that, that's the um, the corporate slide, just a position where Front Range sits in the whole equation. Uh, we've been around for 20 odd years, and the thing about Front Range is that we focus specifically in the service management space. Um, so you're probably familiar with um, the product name Heat. Um, that that's uh, you know our flagship product. Uh, it's gone through a few. Different um, iterations of that. So from Heat uh, Classic, uh, we then had the ITSM product, which was the ITIL-based uh, product, and the product that you see today is based on the latest technologies that's optimized for the web and premises world. So that's um, what we're going to show you today. Um, but along with that, as uh, Luke alluded to earlier, we'll show you a bit of um, uh, voice automation to go with the. Um, service management experience uh, because we feel that that's going to complete the whole end experience. Uh, also, um, just to, to finish off the slide, uh, customers we've got um, customer globally. Uh, we're headquartered in the Silicon Valley in the States, uh, but yeah, we do have customers uh, from different um, industries uh, in Australia as well, as well as Asia. Uh, but um, let's move on to the second slide itself. So at a very high level, uh, what makes our customers happy um, in choosing our product? One is that it is very flexible. So we know that you want a solution that's uh, out of the box based on best practices. So it is a very complete uh, ITIL-based solution. Uh, we've got uh, various six boxes from um, the pink uh, group, so it is pink verified uh, on ITIL 2011. Uh, so yes, it does do the incident problem change, CMDB, release management, knowledge, and all the rest. Uh, but what we want to do is, you know, learn from our experience through years. We want to give you uh, something that's pragmatic to work with, not just being able to take the, all the ITIL boxes and have a very comprehensive. Um, solution with 100 fields on screen, but we also want to give you something that is pragmatic and that can be used by uh, your, your staff on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So uh, very complete in terms of solution, but also at the same time, we understand that you will have different services, different SLAs uh, to meet the requirements of your business, and that's where we need to have a very flexible tool. Um, and so in terms of configuration, uh, we're giving you a, a very advanced platform uh, to be able to configure it, uh, not just changing you know, things like SLAs, the workflows, and automation in terms of business rules, um, 
But to do all of that without scripting or coding, I think that's the key uh, because you do not want to spend uh, most of your time uh, administering the solution itself. So I think the, uh, the, the three key main points um, that our customers like about our platform, uh, but just to give you a bit of uh, uh, an overview of the platform itself, is um, service management that we're looking at today. Uh, but as you can see on the other side of that is the client management. Is where vital best practice solution, and client management is all about managing the applications in your environment. So I'll go into more detail about that, uh, but that is managing everything from um, operating systems, hotfixes, um, packages, um, your applications like Microsoft Office, Google Chrome, uh, Firefox, Adobe Acrobat the application layer, as well as the policies as well uh, that you implement and install on your servers and workstations. Okay, um, But we do not want to lock you in into one single environment. So we do have a hybrid solution. So you can either go cloud or premise, or even if you actually decide that maybe cloud is the solution for you today, uh, but in a year's time, um, if it makes sense and the business strategies change and you need to move it back on premise, it is quite a seamless transition because it is all based on the same, same platform. Um, and why hybrid in the middle? Because we do combine technologies uh, on premise as well as the cloud. And a good example of that is that client management solution, which I mentioned before. So someone might actually go to your service catalog, which is sitting in the cloud, to request for Adobe Acrobat to be installed on the workstation. And through that hybrid approach, it will actually send the message across to the client management tool, which then picks up the package, which is in your local network, and do the installation. So that is one uh, an example, uh, but the other good example as well is the voice solution. So that is something which is traditionally um, very premise-based as a solution, uh, but as a call center, uh, call management solution, we do actually dip into cloud uh, for that for the, that it needs to do, do call um, um, call uh, queries as well. So again, that's another fantastic example, and I'll actually show you a bit of that uh, through the presentation today. Um, now, what our customers have done is say, well, just on the that we need to manage, but it's also external customer support, HR facilities. And at the end of the day, you know, these are all just issues, queries, complaints, uh, case that we need to manage. And the system management platform is the perfect platform for it uh, because it is very flexible, so it's not as if it's just locked into IT. Uh, so they can actually use this in all these different environments and even more. And the good thing about the platform is that it is a very multi tenanted um, solution system. So you'll see that we can actually have uh, you know, segregation at a very basic level and to the uh, very comprehensive level as well. And I'll go into that in, in a couple of slides. Um, but just for today, uh, because we are focusing on server management itself, so I just want to run through some of the modules that we have. So incident, problem, change, release, CMDB, SLM, that's all there. Um, and for your technicians in the field, if you prefer to access the solution through the mobile device, um, for Apple-based devices, iOS, we actually do have a mobile app, which you can download from the App Store. Uh, so that gives them you know, a native app that they can access all the incidents, tasks, or even if they're a change manager, they can actually uh, access all the different approvals and you know, perform all these tasks while they are on the road or they are off-site somewhere. So um, again, something to support the um, second and third level engineers. Uh, in terms of the front end for your end users, we do have a self-service and service catalog portal, and I'll, I'll actually start um, showing you that. That, um, very shortly, and the voice solution. So this is something which is uh, quite uh, new for most people, uh, because they always um, thought that this is something that's out of the service management space. So what we're proposing here is not to take over the whole uh, PABX and voice call management solution that you have today. 
Instead, all it is is just saying that we're going to implement this, uh, if you want, as part of the uh, service desk. So when someone does an extension, say, one, two, three, uh, for the service desk, that will be routed from your existing uh, call management solution to our tool. And because it's a full call management solution, we do have the ability to do caller identification. And once we have identified the caller, we can then put it through an IR or interactive voice response workflow. So to log a new incident, press 1. To create an existing incident, press 2. And one of our key features for this is the third option, which is to reset the domain password. And that is the huge uh, benefit that you're going to get from this platform because 20 to 30 odd percent of your calls are generally a password reset related. So this would actually go across to Active Directory, does a password reset, and reads out the new password for the user. And right away, you can see the productivity gains from this, efficiency gains. You know, someone having a password reset issue doesn't have to wait half an hour for a password reset. Instead, they just pick up the phone and and within a minute, they actually get a new password, and they're back and running uh, into the uh, uh, into the network. But it is a full-featured uh, solution, so we can do call distribution from there based on the different agent skills. Um, and also, as a supervisor, you might be listening in on calls and do call coaching. Um, so that's all uh, part of the platform itself. Um, then the client management piece, piece I have explained uh, what we do in terms of deployment, but we also do have a discovery tool, so that will actually scan the environment and tell you what's on your IT network. So that includes everything from your servers, your desktops, your laptops, uh, your virtual um, devices as well. Uh, but in terms of your network equipment, uh, we do do... Um, scan for that and we do um, uh, get information and all that information goes into your CMDB. So that way you're getting a very accurate CMDB and most updated CMDB um, at any point of time. Um, and the, the other piece I want to mention um, is that we actually provide a MDM solution as well, so to complete the experience. So it's not just about you know, uh, the IT equipment that you have, but the mobile devices, so covering various platforms. And But I'll, I'll, I'll mention that in a couple of slides. Um, just a couple things as well um, about the solution. So we do not want to uh, work in isolation or silos. Um, we do integrate with the rest of the organization, and typically what we get asked for is integration to Active Directory to get uh, your employee information into the system. Uh, so that is certainly capable. We've got native integration to um, Active Directory. Um, if there are information that you want to bring into the platform, there's always a couple of ways through our heat listeners or web services. Um, heat listeners will actually listen for information coming from a file or even through an email, um, through various file formats, and we can then map that information into the platform and it sucks the information in and you can do this on a scheduled basis as well. Web services are very open and API, so we allow you to integrate things like your finance or CRM systems or even your asset management systems into the tool as well. So um, just a very high level slide. Um, and also multi-tenancy, I mentioned that before. So at a very basic level, and this is the traditional approach, which is on the left side of the screen, we can actually have information into one single instance where we're separating it based on your role. Okay, So if you have a group of users come in, if they're HR users, they only see HR-based service requests, incidents, uh, but if uh, you're someone else, you only get to see your own, um, so for example, facilities or IT. But for those of you who want um, a complete separate instance where you say that I do not want to share my data with the rest of the organization, that's where we can have the multi-instance approach, uh, just like what you see on your screen right now. So even though the application layer uh, stays the same, uh, they can have separate instances where if they log 
again, they obviously get their own access to their own specific instance. But as, as a master tenant, which you can set up, you can set the um, security to be able to access all these different instances through a single dashboard. Um, so that way you are across everything that happens at any point of time uh, across all these different instances. But um, as an instance, you can have your own workflow, you can have your own different forms, uh, as I mentioned, your URL uh, logins and all. So, um, yeah, so whatever fits best uh, in terms of your, your requirements. Okay. Um, so I mentioned the client management uh, before, just to uh, have a give you a quick overview of this. So yes, we do manage the operating systems, we do the do the entry scans. Um, so from that, we can do um, software deployment, um, pretty much all the software that uh, you have in the market. And also, if you have something else that you've created, we can actually create all these packages and have that deployed. And that's the key uh, approach about this platform. Everything is packaged by so whether it's an operating system, it's a patch or a software or even a policy, uh, we can actually build this into a package and then say, well, if someone joins us in the marketing department tomorrow, this is the package that we're going to roll out. And package approach is important because if anything changes, you need to add more applicants, you need to change drivers. If there's a print driver change, it's as easy as um, just moving that package from that main package or the marketing package and then um, attaching a different package to it. So it's like Lego blocks, uh, but, but yeah, it's a fantastic approach. Um, and to be able to do this through a very simplified graphic uh, interface. Uh, I think that's that's one of the key um, benefits for your administration team. Instead of having to write uh, pages and pages of code just to roll out Microsoft Office. Okay. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do have uh, mobile device management as well. Uh, so with mobile devices, we can actually tell you what's on those devices. Okay, so all the platforms are supported below, as you can see on the screen. So everything from Blackberries, Windows, Apple, Android. Uh, so we can tell you what's on there uh, in terms of the hardware configuration, where, as well as the applications or apps that's sitting on those devices. Uh, but of course, we would need to have that device secure. So uh, we can actually have policies where if that device is lost, and someone picks it up and switches the SIM card, all information will be wiped from that uh, device. Um, application management as well. So if you don't want your end users installing anything they want from the App Store or um, Google Play, Play uh, what you can do is actually disable that and just have a specific or multiple uh, corporate app stores which they can access to download um, apps that you have approved with the organization. Uh, as an end user, they can access the portal uh, to perform their own uh, backups to make sure that, that um, you know they, they, they have a backup of the uh, system on uh, the corporate network and also to be able to uh, install applications themselves. Uh, we do have a remote support um, feature as well, uh, which is great because sometimes when you're troubleshooting an issue, uh, it is easier for you to be able to access the person's mobile voice and do the troubleshooting, um, looking through, um, you know, even uh, things on that remote device. So basically just having that whole screen uh, within your um, uh, computer itself. And of course, direct access uh, can control uh, what information uh, is is available on the uh, desk, uh, on the mobile device itself. Okay, so that's a very quick overview of uh, what our offerings are. But I do need to show you a bit of software today, so I'm just going to switch across to my VMs, so you can um, have a look at that very shortly. So let me just um, switch now and. Should have that screen available shortly. Okay. 
Okay, so what I'm going to do is start with the end user's view. Okay, so I'll log in into the self-service portal as Marsha Hendrick. So she's an end user, and she's going to go through our service catalog, and you know, she's going to want to log a request. She's going to want to log an incident as well. And then what I'll do is show showcase a product in uh, a this perspective. So you'll see how someone at a service desk would be able to uh, take the calls, manage the call, escalate the call, and then switching over to a configuration manager's hat um, or a change manager's hat. So that's where you'll see how we roll out a change. Uh, show you a bit about the change process and some of the uh, the tools run that, uh, as well as the CMD. Be. Right. So, should have that on your screen. I'm logged in as Marsha Hendrick. Now, just want to point out really quickly, everything is role-based. So, the menu options, the items that you see in the service catalog as well, is all based on your role and, and subscription. Okay. So, right at the top of the screen, um, I've got the service catalog, and this is where I host all the requests as well as incidents. So, if I want to log an issue, um, down, for instance. So instead of me uh, coming in here and saying I need to log an incident, all you do is just go to the top of the screen and just type in what my issue is. In this case, it's a VPN issue. And right away, anything related to VPN shows up at the top of the screen. On the left side, I do have an incident on the right uh, request. So in this case, uh, I'm going to log an incident. And this is important because uh, for your end users, they will not be able to differentiate you know, what's an incident and what's a request. So this easily um, addresses that issue. So right away, as soon as I click on that, it's all based on a template. So I've got all the information on the left side of the screen. If I just want to save that incident, just go click on Save, and I'm done. So within two clicks, I'm done. But what I'm trying to do is take a different approach and say, well, hang on, before you actually click on Save, on the right side of the screen, we've got a couple of solutions. So that is a proactive approach. We don't need them to actually click somewhere to do a search to bring up all related articles. Instead, we are actively showing all these related articles right there in front of the screen. And we've got the VPN for error 413 issue. And the steps to fix this issue are laid out um, in the uh, knowledge base article. So I've got a here. If I I'm happy with this question. I can rate the article and say that's exactly what it's looking for. And if it was helpful, I can provide some feedback and comments as well. So, you can see, it's no different from you rating, um, you know, when you're doing a purchase off the internet. No different from you rating a vendor or a product and, you know, providing some feedback as well. This is what the end users are used to, and that's what we're doing. We're, we're not changing the world. Uh, we're giving them something that they're very familiar with. Okay? If that resolves the issue, as you can see it's, there's, at the bottom right, there's an option to resolve it. And if I still want to go ahead and save that incident, just click on Save Incident. And that's what I'm going to do, save that off, and you'll see that it's created the incident for me when I switch to my service desk view. Um, but let me just go back to the service catalog. And this time, I'm just going to do some of our service requests. Now, there's quite a few that is available out of the box. There's about 80 odd service requests, and they are all available uh, for you. It's it's not as if they are chargeable um, uh, for, for these different um, request templates that we. Have. So instead, um, you can see we've got everything from requests for day backup, uh, requesting for new equipment, requesting for system access, um, and the software installation. That's actually a really good example uh, because that's where we will be able to access our client management solution uh, to do the deployment. So if someone requests for Adobe Acrobat to be installed, as I mentioned earlier, they can come in here, put in that request, and five, ten minutes later in the background, that's being installed in the workstation. If you do need approvals, we have got a strong workflow uh, designer which allows you to um, create all the workflow approvals that you need uh, before uh, that software is being deployed. Okay. But what I want to show you is also the HR type 
uh, service requests. So, like I said, it's pretty comprehensive for everything from requesting to get onto a training course, bit, ordering business cards, uh, a bonus request uh, that's also there, leave request, new employees set up, um, and for facilities, um, everything from requesting for uh, a travel request, um, moving offices, um, booking a conference room. So that's there as well. Um, since, again, um, that was one of the templates that I showed you before for logging a vaping issue. Uh, but, yeah, there's quite a few available out of the box. But coming back to um, what I showed you earlier with uh, HR requests. So if I need something to do with an employee setup, I click on that. And right up front, you can see it takes two weeks to fulfill that request. So I've got um, John Smith here. Oops, it's just on caps. Smith, and he's going to be an executive uh, VP of something. So I'll just put in VP. And the start date is going to be, yep, the two weeks, don't we? So we can see that everything's grayed out. But of course, that's your call. Then when I go, uh, when I get to the next um, page, which is facilities, and I can say I want this person to be based in Melbourne and probably set an off space for John and you can set the space location as well, so second floor um, overlooking South Bank or something like that. But on the right side of the screen, uh, we do have a shopping cart, which then says, well, if you need an office space, that's going to be an extra 200 Okay, so I think you get the idea. Uh, very similar to you purchasing uh, anything off the web, whether it's um, uh, products or even booking flights or accommodation it's pretty much the same approach. So if you do need a computer for John, you can always select um, a laptop and then the options that goes with it. So you can see it's very contextual as well. If you need to um, need that information, then it shows up. Or if it doesn't, then it is hidden away. Um, do have graphics as well. So for example, if you're getting the iPhone, you can see exactly what it looks like. Um, and all that is is just making sure that we are setting the right expectation with the user so they'll know exactly what they're getting, exactly what they've ordered for. Okay, so quickly finishing that off, and I'm just going to save and submit that. And then I can view my items. So these are all the incidents and service requests that I've logged. And if I do need to check on the progress. Um, I can always click on, on um, for example, I've got this one over here, um, so service request uh, that's logged, and I can see that uh, once you get to the progress tab, um, all the different tasks that's been automatically uh, created, which is to configure the phone and voicemail, set up the computer, workspace, and the security key card. So that's all being created in the background, and as they are being completed, uh, that's where it will actually um, update that search request, and I can see exactly where these in the uh, progress bar. So hopefully that uh, would have showed up on your screen, and I'm just going to navigate back to the uh, service catalog. So what I've shown you so far is how we log an incident and how we log a request. Okay, um, but just before I leave the portal. There's two things I want to quickly show you. So one is how we configure one of these requests because that is something which uh, we get asked for all the time. Um, how do we uh, do this easily because there's new service requests that we need to create um, as the business grows, as we see a new benefit for this. And I did say that everything is uh, configurable without coding, and um, that's what I'm going to show you now. So first of all, we've got a wizard-based approach. So this is the first page. When we go into the second page, that's where we design the form. So on the form itself, uh, we've got all these different fields on the left side of the screen and the field types on the right side of the screen. So I can grab a date, time, numeric, drop-down field as I need. And so, for example, I've put it... Um, for example, the iPhone earlier, and if I need to have a drop down for a cover, I can always drag and drop that field onto 
to form. So you should see that uh, fairly shortly. Um, I'm just doing that right now. And what I'll do is just give it a label. And I'll have the cover type. And that's pretty much it. So I've my field. It's on the screen. And did say I was going to use the drop down. So this is where I can actually define a pick list. So once I open up that um, menu for that field which I just created, uh, you should be able to see a pick list option, and that's where I can have a custom pick list, or if I have a table that holds all that information, that's where I can put um, uh, specify that pick list. But if not, if I just want to create something from scratch, so I can say I want a generic cover, and it's going to cost me 20, but if I want to go something uh, that's more sophisticated, so uh, maybe cover uh, with um, with uh, a stand, for instance. It's going to cost an extra 30, and that's where we can actually specify uh, images to support it as well. But once you're done, just hit OK. I'm not sure if you saw some of the options before, but it also allows you to define the visibility rules, whether it's a required field. Um, and also, um, but they're all expression based, so it's not just a yes no option. Um, but when I save that, you can actually then have a quick view, and you should be able to see the cover type um, on your screen now. And if I hit that drop down button, uh, you'll actually see that we've got all those options that I specified um, earlier. So that's as easy as it is to create a new field. and. A drop down as well, but I did talk about the workflow flow before, and just want to quickly show you how we configure this. So, very simplified UI. Okay, new employee set up that started process, and showed you the four different tasks that we had to create before. So, these are all the four different tasks. Now, challenge is to do all of this without any scripting or coding. So, for example, if we look at this facilities um, task. It is actually have a block over here, and when we open up the block, you do not see any code at all. What you see is a template which says, "This is where I'm going to escalate to the operations team." Summary: That's the details. Here's the priority level. We also made it flexible, so you actually do need to specify and not hard code a field to priorities one, two, three, four, or five, and make it a field-based value. That's where you have the option for field. Likewise, you'll see that in the timeout duration, so you can actually specify it to uh, a fixed timeout or if you want to make it field-based. Okay? Because with the field, it is very flexible. You can actually automate and use business rules to calculate the, um, the actual uh, expiry time, and that way um, it is very dynamic based on uh, the request uh, that you get. Okay, but similar to what I shared before, on the left side of the screen, uh, we've got various options uh, to have uh, a different uh, workflow process. So what I'm just quickly showing you right now is the ability to have statements or even to be able to use switches uh, in the workflow itself. So it, it's this As a result. Uh, you'll execute, uh, um, okay, give you a specific example. So if a person logs a request, if that person is an executive, then you do not need approval. You're just going to go ahead and execute the task. But if that person is not the executive, then you do need to get the approvals. And the process itself is very dynamic. So as you can see over here, uh, again, based on the template, it says, do you need approval from a group or from a specific user? And if you want to make it dynamic, again, we can use a field-based value for that. And how do we know if it's approved? So on the right, we have the approval denial criteria. And very flexible, because we will say it is approved if users, any user, a number of users, or such of users approves this. And at the same time, if anyone does not deny it, or a percentage denies it, uh, but again, it's all criteria based on the uh, down you'll, that you'll see in front of you uh, right now, then if anyone rejects it, then it's going to be denied. So, um, flexible and without 
writing any code at all. Um, that is a very complex um, uh, with that we've just achieved uh, quite easily. Okay, um, and also you need to send out notifications and all. So that's where again we can reuse templates that we've defined. So we're looking to get an approval notification out, so we can actually send out uh, send notification for a vote. Okay, yeah, and of course we don't want that sitting there forever, so we can have uh, approval deadlines as well, uh, which is just on the bottom left screen. But um, so hopefully that gives you an idea of how we actually configure this. Uh, the other common question that we get is if we have a multi-tiered approval process, it's as easy as dragging another approval block, block onto the uh, designer. So we'll have, say, the uh, the initial approver, but once that's approved, then it goes to a committee for approval as well. Um, so that's just um, dragging another approval block and appointing it um, to the next approval uh, block for uh, the secondary approval. Okay, like I said, hopefully that gives you a sense of how it's configured. Um, now, that is what I want to show you in terms of the self-service portal itself. But just to tick the boxes, yes, we do have a social board. So this is where your users as well as the service desk can collaborate online uh, and post messages. Um, what I want to quickly show you that is unique to uh, to us is that the, we have the ability to then say, well, if someone's reported an issue like the VPN being down and we want that to uh, be raised as an incident or even a problem, that's where I can actually go click on the little icon over here and create an incident or even a problem. If it's just information that uh, we, we saw and that would be useful in a knowledge base, absolutely. You can click on Create Knowledge Base Article and that will create uh, a knowledge entry for you. Uh, yes, it will still go through the knowledge approval process uh, before it is um, available for your customers. And right side of the screen, you can see a chat. Okay, so that's where Marsha can chat with the service desk to uh, just as another channel to get across to the service desk. Okay, um, but I spent quite a bit of time um, in the self-service portal itself, and I do want to switch across to the service desk view. And to do that, I am switching across to my next browser. Then there's Peter here, and so he's a service desk analyst. So he's just waiting for a call to come in. And so to show you this experience, rather than just create a new incident from scratch, what I'll do is actually show you this from a voice um, perspective. So this is Marsha, sorry, this is John calling into the service desk and, and he's going to log a new call and I'll show you how we do screen pops. So now, just bear in mind that I'm actually just using some of the automated voice, um, but of course, you know, organization, you will actually have uh, like a call recording uh, for your voice option. So it sounds a bit robotic, but just to hopefully give you a sense of how this uh, sounds like. So I'm going to call now as John. The service desk. To a new incident, press 1. To inquire an existing incident, press 2. To accept your domain password, press 3. If you are not John Smith, press 9. I'm just going to go ahead and press 1 to log a new call. For hard issues, please press 1. For soft issues, please press 2. Again, I'm just going to select uh, hardware um, as the uh, issue. So at the service desk, you can see that um, that person is not ready to take a call, but I'm just going to put myself into ready mode. So you have this tool that's sitting conveniently at the top of your screen. I'm just going to set myself to ready, and I'm just going to press 1 right now, and you'll see the screen pop happen. Okay, so that's just called across to the service desk. As you can see, the ringtone, and because everything is integrated into the service management platform, I can accept the call that's, um, that's just come through. I've got my screen pop. I know it's John, and based on my simple R I know that it is John uh, calling up and about a hardware issue. So I'm just going to take this call so you can see the green button at the top of your screen on the toolbar, and that will uh, accept the call, and now it's actually uh, picked up the call. So I just hung up earlier. but uh, So 
that hopefully shows you how everything is integrated. The big plus is that all this is through directly into the incident module, and you are interacting with the zone direct from the incident module itself. Okay, so let me give you an, another example of um, how we can leverage off the uh, the voice module itself. So this is where now John's going to call in and he's forgotten his uh, password. So I'm going to press three when it goes through the IVR to log uh, password reset. Cool. Thanks for calling the service desk. To renew incident, press one. Wired about an existing incident, press two. To your domain password, press two. I'm just. I press three, and it is asking me for an IVR code, and this is something which you can, uh, you know, specify uh, on your requirements. So it could be an uh, just a code, or it could be an employee ID. So whatever suits your organization. Your password is K N. Okay, so as it's reading out the password, I just muted it, but you see of how quickly and easily someone can get back into uh, the network just by doing a password reset uh, as this. So I'm just going to hang up that call, but I think uh, what you'll find interesting is that if I go back to the service desk itself, you can now see I've got a call that's logged, and if I open it up, Double one, zero, double two. You can see that John Smith has called up, and, and using the templates that we have, uh, we can see that there's a password reset call. The call is closed, and we've got all the classifications there. Um, we've got emails have been sent out as well back to John. So everything is recorded. You have all the stats that you need, um, and that's what you get when you have an integrated. Um, service desk and voice environment. So all the stats are going to hurry up. You'll know exactly how many password reset calls you've received um, over a period of time. So useful. And of course, you know, we've got call recording as well. So if someone calls after hours, all calls are being recorded as well as the voice recording of voice message that they've left uh, as an attachment to the call itself. So it's quite a uh, quite a few features. And uh, this is uh, yeah, a definite benefit to um, the whole service management experience because this is you know, what uh, your end users will face when they call up the uh, service desk. Okay, but um, let me just um, switch, um, switch mode now, and I'm just going to log in this time as an administrator to show you all the other options or functions that we have um, in the uh, service management platform. So logging in as myself, and I'm just going to take the administrator's role this time. And now I just want to walk you through uh, some of the uh, reporting options uh, before just jumping into an incident itself. So we do have um, our analytic metrics, which is what you'll see on your screen very shortly. Um, you've got the chat on the screen as well. I'm just going to tuck that away for now. Uh, but the analytic metrics is what your uh, service desk would see when they log into the system. So just breaking it down by um, incidents that come through, um, incidents that's about to breach, um, elevations, um slicing and dicing the information in various ways. So with that as your real-time sort of um, reports, uh, but also you have your uh, back-end reports as well. So that's where we're going to measure a lot of KPIs. But just going across to the incident form, so that's what I showed you earlier. Um, now, I showed you how we do a screen pop. So if Marsha calls up or John calls up as before, we'll go straight to the call. Uh, but if you do need to type in, uh, for example, Marsha's call about an Outlook issue, I can just type that at the top of the screen, that takes me exactly to that call. And once I have that call up, um, the biggest pluses of the incident module is that we allow you to have a complete uh, visibility over the service desk. And what I mean by that is, for example, right now, if I log a call against a VPN issue, what you'll see automatically popping up on the right side of your screen, we've got a little panel which is 
um, probably the biggest benefit you'll get um, in the um, service desk itself because that is showing you every uh, related incident, problem, or knowledge base article uh, to help you resolve you uh, resolve the issue. Okay, um, or just give you that level of visibility because how many times has it been where you know you log an incident and you know before you know it um, you actually look up the incidents for the day and there's been 50 incidents logged. It's just that no one's bothered to look it up. So this way, with that vis level of visibility, you'll know right away that you know that's been 19 incidents like the one on the screen uh, that's been logged and, and you, you can immediately raise uh, a major incident process or even a problem if you don't uh, have the root cause. Okay, so that's uh, a really good, um, uh, useful uh, fun piece of function that you can use. And also, if it's related to a problem, right away, as you can see, I can link that problem to the incident, or even uh, if there's a resolution, I can use the resolution information as well. Okay. Um, but you know, it is a very pragmatic approach. So you can see from the screen, it is very simplified. You know, we've got the customer's details, or if it's reported by someone else, we've got a very flexible SLA model as well. So you can have a default SLA, or you can have a very specific SLA. For example, if it's a priority one issue for an executive, they can have a different response and resolution time. Um, but um, in terms of uh, incidents itself, um, showed you a bit about the form and how we can search. Um, we can actually pin this to a watch list. So at the end of the day, before you leave uh, for the day, you always have uh, a nice little uh, pin it watch list on, on your uh, top right of your screen. So if you need to come back to anything, this is almost like a post-it note. Okay. Uh, but the other module, which I want to skip to uh, very quickly, is our change module. And the change module is very comprehensive, so we do cover everything from your standard changes uh, all the way to your emergency and main changes as well. But just to give you a quick example of this, um, if I have um, a, a major change like the one that you see on screen, uh, of course we're going to track who has requested the change, the business sponsor, uh, the, the change coordinator as well. But the big um, gate, uh, I suppose, a gatekeeper is you know the level of change uh, that's required and the risk level. So, so that's has been a very uh, a great area, and the way that we have addressed that is through our risk level calculator. So based on your responses uh, so, uh, and the questions that you define. So for example, the ones that we have here are. If the outage is going to be widespread, then that's going to be a hard risk change. If there's going to be multiple applications, more than 70% of the organizations will be affected. That will actually change it to a high risk change. So that you can have rules to say that if it's a high risk change, then it be a major change process that you need to go through. What that means is more hoops that you need to jump through and, uh, before you get the actual approval uh, for the change itself. Um, of course, we need to link the affected APIs. So I've got things like the uh, computer type, uh, sorry, the computer. I've got the application itself as well as the services. Uh, but just want to drill down quickly into the CI. So this is coming from a discovery tool. So you should be able to see uh, the details uh, configure and details of that computer. Obviously, we've got different types of CIs. There's, I think, about 20 different types of CIs out of the box, and they all have different forms, different fields. Uh, but just showing you what uh, a computer CI looks like. Now, that is specific to that CI. Okay. As a change manager, as a config manager, you want to know how this sits in the whole CMDB. And as you can imagine, I've got a CMDB diagram shows me the relationships between all these different items. So that shows you uh, how that finance server itself um, sits uh, in relation to the finance service. So as I mentioned, this is a CDB diagram. It's not a network topology. It's not showing you how ports are connected, um, but instead CMDB dependency. So what this allows me to do is then look at the um, 
you can there's an exclamation uh, against that machine itself that tells me quickly that there's two incidents against this uh, one problem and four other changes. So again, just giving you that extra bit of visibility. Uh, if there's other changes being performed on that uh, server, uh, yeah, perhaps we need to avoid it. Uh, but also, as you can see on the screen, uh, we do an outage impact, which tells you exactly what services uh, will be affected. Okay, but you know that's just the perspective of the CI itself, and, and with every bit of CI, we do need to track what different outage window we have and freezes that we have. And that becomes a nightmare my, when you're trying to study change. So with all these different CIs involved or affected with a change, we need to have something like uh, the change scheduler, which is what you see uh, on your screen now. And this allows me to then say, well, if we put all these CIs side by side, when in the windows and lockout period, the next available change window. So that's where uh, I can easily now pick out a date and time uh, to perform the change without having uh, conflicts. So at the end of the day, you know, having all these different processes uh, in place helps us to then uh, minimize any conflicts or change failures. Um, Okay. Um, then this is well where we actually hit a fork in the road. So either we can then, now that we've got the approvals, I can then implement the change through the change model itself. And, and as an option, well, best practice says do that through release, but not all organizations want to do it that way. Um, but we've got the release module. The release module shows you, uh, which you should see on the screen fairly shortly, um, how we manage the release as a project because it is the deployment into the environment itself. And basically, if we rolled out by the book, we've got specific milestones in place that we can adhere to. Um, so we've got things like the plan building, testing, and review closure phases, um, and against every one of these milestones to make sure that we do this by the book, uh, we've got specific templates that we use, and for this, we've got uh, multiple tasks uh, aligned against the build and test, which is to build the test package as well as a test package. So we'll assign that to different groups to perform, and once they've completed that, hopefully you'll see shortly, we've got a checklist to make sure that that person that performed that task um, actually records uh, the result of that task uh, in the checklist. Okay, but as you can see, with various milestones, various tasks as well, but you need that overall perspective of where you are at in the whole process, and that's where you have the release schedule. And what you'll see shortly is that we've got all the different phases, all the different tasks put together in a nice little Gantt chart. So that gives you that overall view. And a lot of customers looking at this now, they're saying, well, use that for project management and yes the answer is you can actually uh, use this for projects uh, you can also use this for software development life cycles uh, that's in fact what uh, we use front range itself internally to manage all our releases uh, hot fixes that we roll out for our products um, so you can track exactly where you're at and have all these different milestones and tasks and progress bars to support it but um, hopefully uh, that gives you uh, a quick view of our service management tool. Um, everything from the incident or service request logged through the end user portal, uh, then moving across to the uh, service desk view, and finally across to the uh, change or configuration manager's view. Uh, and, and yeah, so that uh, completes the cycle. But um, of course, it's uh, a very short overview. We'd like to show you this in a more in-depth um, session. And so for that, I, I think um, I'll conclude for now. I'll hand it back to Luke. And if we've got any questions, um, I'm happy to address it now. Just checking Luke. Uh, Luke is saying that we 
don't have any questions, but um, might give it a couple of seconds. If not, uh, I right, everyone sitting in the webinar today. Hopefully, that was a useful session. Uh, but as I, men as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is just the uh, very high level overview. And um, yeah, hope to uh, have a follow up session with you shortly. Uh, with that, uh, I thank you for uh, attending today, and I'll pass it back on to Luke now. Thank you, okay. um, well, thank you again, Gary, for a fantastic demo. Went through everything really well. Um, I'll again, thank everyone for their attendance. Um, as always, following the session, we'll send through the recording and the slides, and uh, we will do a ring around just um, after the event to get your thoughts and whether you require any more information. Uh, at the end, you'll be re redirected to our Contact Us page. So if you have any further questions or you have any comments, what have you, just drop us a line there and we'll get back. Um, until then, enjoy the rest of your day. All right.